Lou, and welcome to the sixth episode of Franklin, the City Skyline series where I say I'll be gone for one week and then actually disappear for two weeks. Today we're going to talk about the water supply system for the city of Franklin. During this episode I'm going to talk about some historical water supply systems, the particular water supply system we will be building for Franklin, and relate that to some modern practices and politics around water supply systems today, including a little bit about the field of water resource management as it applies to dams and reservoirs. Part of this episode involves digging a hole for a reservoir, but, you know, terraforming time lapses are always pretty boring, I think. That was easy. So here's some basic information and history about municipal water supply systems. The most basic kind of water supply system is a flowing body of water. You put a bucket in it, you take the water out with the bucket, you carry the bucket to your house and you use the water as you need to. Failing that, of course, you can dig a well if there's no water nearby. You dig into the ground until you hit the groundwater, you stick a bucket in there and you get the water out. You can also drill into rock and if you're lucky, hit a confined aquifer and end up with an artesian well. This is a well where the pressure from the confined aquifer forces water out of the well on its own. Confined aquifers are where the natural water level of the groundwater is higher than ground level because it's confined by the rock or sometimes impervious clay above it. Wells are great, but they're usually quickly overwhelmed by demand for water in urban areas. Rivers quickly become polluted by runoff from cities. People dump poop and garbage in the river if there are no sewers. And even if there are sewers, guess where they go? Sewers are going to be an entirely different episode, by the way. Today we're only getting water into the city. The ancient Romans figured out a better method than wells or drinking contaminated river water. They rerouted clean water from a distant source to where it was needed in the cities. They did this by means of aqueducts, enormous brick and stone structures which carried water over long distances at a constant slope. They fed public fountains where people could collect water, as well as the Roman baths and public toilets. There was also limited water distribution to homes and businesses. Aqueducts remained the best way to supply cities for more than a millennium, but they had their drawbacks. Aqueducts typically began at a spring or other source of pure water, but that water be could become polluted if the weather was unfavorable. A downpour at the source of an aqueduct could cause it to run muddy for days or weeks at a time. Settling pools and other primitive filtration systems were developed, but were still frequently overwhelmed by the force of nature. Aqueducts were also prone to leaking and pirate water connections. However, their greatest disadvantage was their use of open channel flow. Open channel flow means the water has a free surface, that is, it's exposed to the air. This means the water will only travel downwards, otherwise it'll collect in low areas. This is as opposed to pipe flow, where the water is confined in a pipe. A pipe can go up, down, sideways, do corkscrews, so on, and the water will still flow along it, so long as it remains below the free surface of the reservoir that supplies it, minus some losses from friction. So aqueducts needed to cross rivers and enter city centers on those huge bridges we associate with aqueducts today since they couldn't travel uphill at all. The Romans had some ability to make pipes for local distribution of aqueduct water and to allow aqueducts to cross particularly deep valleys by means of a siphon, but mineral buildup and blockages led the Romans to avoid using pipes for long distances. Aqueducts fell into disuse in the Dark Ages and Middle Ages in Europe, but continued to be used in the East. The oldest part of Istanbul is actually still fed by a Roman-era aqueduct today, uh, though with 
extensive repairs and modifications by the Ottomans. Many aqueducts in Rome which fell into disrepair were renovated and restored to functional use in the Renaissance. For instance, in 1453, Pope Nicholas V restored the Aqua Virgo, built in 19 BCE. It still serves many fountains in the campus marshes to this day. New aqueducts started to be built and continue to be built until the 18th century when pipe making technology had improved to the point where it was practical to pipe water over long distances. So back here in Franklin, the city was beginning to feel the strain of relying on river water for all its needs. A primitive water supply system had been installed with a pumping station in the center square, which I didn't build, uh, but it almost immediately proved unable to meet the growing city's demands owing to its extremely small reservoir effectively a large wooden tank about the size of a large above-ground swimming pool. After a series of yellow fever epidemics thought to have been caused by contaminated water, the city appointed a watering committee. Building an aqueduct to a distant water source was deemed impractical. Instead, the committee identified a nearby hill, let's call it Good Hill, which was located near enough to the city that it could serve as a reservoir for water pumped from the city's other, less contaminated river. So a pumping station was built, which used the new, exciting, and largely unproven steam engine to pump water through large wooden pipes to the top of Good Hill, where it was stored in a reservoir and then distributed to the city center via gravity through smaller wooden pipes. These wooden pipes are effectively just hollowed out tree trunks. This worked well for a time, but it was expensive, and the steam engines were primitive and dangerous. After the boilers had exploded twice, the Good Hill Water Works Company decided to switch to an older but more proven technology, water power. Eight large water wheels were installed in large channels beneath the surface of the new, expanded waterworks. These water wheels drove pumps, which pumped the water up to the reservoir. It took 30 gallons pouring over the water wheels to pump one gallon of water to the reservoir. A weir was constructed to divert water from the river to the conduits behind the waterworks, as well as for flood control and improved navigation. A set of locks for barges and boats was also constructed to allow for navigation of the river above the weir. This method proved both safer and cheaper than steam power, and it ran continuously with little maintenance and no fuel. Although the draw on the reservoir could be larger during the day than the pumps could replace, the pumps ran all night and easily replenished enough water for the next day. As a miracle of modern industry, the Good Hill Water Works had a second function, as a tourist attraction. It was lavishly decorated with neoclassical structures and follies. Gardens were built around the complex for pleasure seekers and visitors, and frequent tours were offered for curious folks to see the water wheel pumps at work. The original steam pump house was converted into a saloon. The Good Hill Water Works became a place to see and be seen. To preserve water quality, the city also bought up thousands of acres of land upstream of the water works to prevent it from being developed for industrial use. This later became Good Hill Park, which we'll talk about in a later episode, I guess. Okay, so this series is Franklin, though, so I'm sure you're thinking, what's the catch? Seems pretty great, right? A huge new park, a beautifully landscaped, pollution-free pumping facility, abundant clean water supply to the city at low cost, a new tourist attraction. Well, there were a few catches. Uh, water was only supplied to a limited number of homes and businesses. You had to subscribe to the Good Hill Water Works system to get water in your house, as well as pay for the system to be installed. If there wasn't a main on your street yet, you and your neighbors might have to split the cost to get it put in, or they might be too poor to afford it and then you'd be on the hook for the whole thing if you wanted water. 
public fountains were installed for those who couldn't afford subscriptions, resulting in a moderate quality of life increase for those who previously walked long distances for water. Uh, another thing is the grounds, the gardens, uh, the beautiful landscaping were all but completely inaccessible to the vast majority of Franklintonians. There were still indentured servants, there were still a few slaves, and even if you were free and you were poor, you were probably working 14-hour days, six or even seven days a week. You didn't have time for leisure, you hardly had time to get a drink of water from one of the public fountains. The water was cleaner, of course, but chances are you were drinking hard cider or whiskey or apple jack anyway. You might even be paid in those beverages. The economic benefits of the Good Hill Waterworks were obvious and far-reaching, but the direct quality of life increase for the average Franklintonian was minimal. What it did result in was a huge increase in the ability to develop land, which we'll get into during the next episode. Uh, perhaps the most direct negative effects, you could say, would be attributed to the construction of the weir, which is the big dam spanning the river. Those negative effects, though, were primarily confined to the natural environment uh, in favor of making the uh, river useful for other purposes, leading us to the field of water resource management. So, in the real world today, the vast majority of dams and reservoirs serve multiple porpoises which directly conflict with each other. A dam and reservoir can exist for flood control, electricity generation, drinking and irrigation water supply, and navigation all simultaneously, and all of these uses have different optimum reservoir water levels. For instance, a purely flood control reservoir ought to have the lowest water level at all times so you have room for the flood waters to come in. A purely drinking water reservoir ought to aim to be full so it can be depleted during times of drought. A reservoir with a dam generating electricity needs high water level at all times to maximize the uh, water flow through the turbines. A dam which improves navigation of a river requires a constant water level. If the water level is too low, the docks become useless. If it's too high, those docks might go underwater. By the way, despite what Donnie from Queens thinks, storing water for wildfire control is not a primary use for a reservoir. The problem with fighting forest fires is less about the quantity of water and more about getting the water where it needs to go, which is usually in remote locations. They could open the reservoirs and provide more water, sure, and the water would flow downstream, not towards the fires. To fight the fire by opening a reservoir would require actually rerouting rivers, which, you know, that's an actual Herculean labor. Effective wildfire fighting requires more conventional means, like child prison labor. So dam and reservoir operation is a delicate balancing act where different uses are impeded by different water levels. An objectively negative impact, however, is on the natural environment, and sometimes even the built environment. Dams usually stop fish from swimming upstream to spawn. They frequently submerge useful land and sometimes even towns. They turn a flowing river into a lake, which radically alters the habitat of local wildlife. Environmental activists today frequently call for dam removal in areas which have been particularly damaged by their construction. However, removal of dams is often impractical in many areas, since populations rely on the steady and reliable water supply. Overall, then, dams and water control structures are a land of contrasts. So it's important to remember that while these new waterworks were the jewel of the city, the vast majority of residents didn't see a huge increase in quality of life because of it. Piped water was a luxury for the rich and upper middle classes. Plumbing would not come to the majority of houses until the late 19th century and some houses in isolated areas of the city would go without plumbing until the 1950s. However, I don't think anyone could argue 
that by any means the construction of a water supply system was a bad thing for almost anyone. It provided jobs, it led to the economic development in the city, it prevented disease and supplied cleaner and more usable water more conveniently than before. The only negative effect may have been one on the environment, one which would soon be overshadowed by industrial development. While many did not initially benefit from the Good Hill Water Works, the benefits would eventually trickle down to all if they were willing to wait 80 years. Okay, I'm going to do a commercial for the channel here. Sorry I took a two-week break instead of the one-week break promised. I have some exciting episodes uh, lined up the next three weeks, though. Episode 7 is going to be a discussion on the development of liberalism, which is the political philosophy that exists in tandem with capitalism. Episode 8, we're going to see the first railroads come to Franklin. I want to do an episode on policing sometime soon, and I'm keeping the power politics and planning series going. An episode should show up soon, but I'm not sure exactly which day, and it'll be on Bisquicklehausen's channel so I can poach all his viewers. Now, I want to draw your attention to that Patreon link that's in the description below. If you all like the series, I encourage you all to become a Patreon. I'm planning on doing some bonus Patreon-only content sometime in the future, uh, not exactly what kind or how frequently, but it will exist. Uh, with your help, I can finally get in on the left-wing content racket and get that Chapo Trap House money and start my anti-capitalist hedge fund where we buy corporations, fire the C-suite and upper-level management, and convert them to worker co-ops. Uh, if you don't want to support me monthly, I also have a BMC, that's Buy Me a Coffee, link in the description, where you can give me some money one time, but I don't have any, like, rewards for that. Sorry, that's just a straight donation. And I'm going to spend the money on student loans and beer instead of coffee. Also, I think it should be fairly clear this episode was based on the Fairmount Waterworks in Philadelphia, so I've included a link to a good video about that in the description if you want more information about that actual structure and its history. Anyway, thanks for watching, thanks for your support, and on to the cinematics.